In this podcast, we're going to be going over the proper role of the U.S. Uh, diplomat as well as the U.S. State, uh, State Department. Now, before we get to that, we're going to, I'm going to ask people to consider donating to my uh, uh, Patreon page. at www.patreon.com slash challenge history. Uh, we have base levels at $1, $10, and $25. Uh, before we get to a uh, $50 uh, and $100 prime levels, which the $50 will have once we reach a certain level, we will get uh, a giveaway for a uh, Roman uh, silver coin, and the $100 level will be a giveaway for a gold Byzantine coin. And uh, it'll be once, once it becomes uh, financially uh, feasible. And it'll start at a year yearly giveaway. Then I'll try to make it more and more uh, readily available. And then the uh, one dollar, ten dollar, and twenty five dollar levels will eventually have giveaways uh, with appropriate gifts uh, for those levels. Uh, once uh, those get enough people in those levels, and uh, those will be for. Uh, uh, on the same level, on the same ideas with it. If you want to learn more uh, about what all the money goes for with it, you could actually go to my uh, Patreon page, and you can kind of get more of an idea. And there's a little bit of an introduction as well that I wrote on February 23rd, and uh, you could also uh, send any comments to me asking about it as well uh, into my. Uh, uh, and to me at YouTube with it as well if you're interested and uh, because it's meant to go toward uh, help me because I'm on disability as well as go toward equipment for the podcast as well and to kind of give me uh, an income as well on top of that and that's what it's meant to do uh, and it will give a little more of a basic idea of what it is and I think I think anyone who who gives even the base level donation, because it really really helps me out, helps me with uh, establishing an uh, income. Now, basically, onto this idea with it, we're going to go with uh, we go with the idea of the actual role of being a diplomat from, essentially, the first Secretary of State. I mean, what other better idea of how to be a diplomat and uh, how to run the Secretary of State than the first one that we had? And that's uh, basically Thomas Jefferson. And there should be no other ideas uh, to work from that uh, whole point than Thomas Jefferson. Uh, frankly, he wrote the Declaration of Independence and uh, much of what uh, what he wrote were uh, was actually uh, in the uh, pretty much him and Madison were the ones that pretty much came about with the Constitution, and it should be no doubt that he should be the one that we follow for actually going with the system for how to be a diplomat and how to run the State Department. If you want to know how to run it, you should go to the basically the first person that ran it. You shouldn't be, be, uh, go to other people that have run it since then. Go to the first person. It's basically, uh, uh, it's very, very simple That's uh, how to actually do it. Now this article comes from uh, Lawrence M. Vance uh, from September 1st of 2004 from LouRockwell.com. And we can see that uh, we can go with his quote, Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Now, what we're seeing with it is just within the last month, we see our uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, try to influence the Israeli elections and try to declare an unelected president in Venezuela as their actual president. This is essentially you're not you're not actually you're not following anything close to the actual original intent. 
now when we start to go to the uh, uh, when we start to go to the idea of what is actually meant for uh, some of these ideas we can actually go to uh, a segment from today's uh, Ron Paul Liberty Report and uh, this is from, uh, they actually put this segment up on Twitter 49 minutes ago. Iraq to, uh, 2019 American president is shunned. Iranian president welcomed. The second part of our title, who won the Iraq war? And of course we meant that ironically, because as you've been pointing out, increasingly uh, it seems to be Iran. From Rouhani, the Iranian leader, he went over to Iraq and he was greeted like a king. He was greeted like the neocon said we'd be greeted. <laughs> he was greeted like a liberator. Uh, he visited every political faction, every religious faction. Uh, they agreed on a bunch of new economic deals uh, that bring the trade between the two countries from 12 billion to 20 billion, so almost doubling trade between the two countries. Iran just sits back and all of these things are happening because of the foolishness of listening to the end. Talk about unintended consequences. You know, the press didn't cover it very much because I didn't see too much at all about when our president went over there at Christmas time yeah. to visit with the leader in Iraq and he was actually shunned. I mean, it, yeah. it would have been considered if under normal circumstances as, as pretty a strong insult toward us because uh, the president couldn't even say hello to the leadership there and he just turned around and left. And you know, we are, we're a prisoner of our so-called alliances, if you think about it. It's totally one-sided. Uh, because of the Saudis uh, being arch enemies of, of Iran and the Israelis wanting to see Iran government overthrown, we are sort of, because we follow rather than lead, uh, we follow their diktats, it's a one-sided thing and we're the, we're the losers of it. Well, I think the ultimate shock and awe is going to be that history is going to show that it was one of the stupidest things our country ever did and that our continuation of policy in that region isn't much better. But nevertheless, uh, it's the principle of intervention versus non-intervention. And non-intervention is the best thing for America, for us to mind our own business, take care of our problems here at home, and make sure that we stand for liberty rather than standing for world empire. And that, that should give you a real good clue in what uh, in what things have actually happened because we've actually had uh, we've actually had these things of entangling alliances with Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel and uh, it can actually be extended over with NATO as well, which is a uh, militant arm of the United Nations uh, meant for. Uh, the idea of the United States with uh, many European countries. It was originally meant to deal with the with the Soviet Union, but as we know that the Soviet Union, when you start to look at the idea of that, uh, you will see that the Soviet Union has been gone since. Uh, uh, what's the exact uh, year? 1991, specifically when we look at the actual date. Um, let me see if we can actually get an actual date. Uh, December 26, 1991. So basically uh, the day after Christmas of 1991. So we're talking, it's been gone uh, for basically... Uh, over uh, 20 years, we're we're getting very uh, we're getting very very close to almost 30 years gone, and yet uh, we still have the uh, NATO existing. Now that means NATO has no function. Now what what you'll have these neoconservatives try to say is, oh, but Russia. Well, when we look at the actual defense spending. Russia is actually a far cry from what we actually have in NATO. Even just NATO alone with it, which is actually not even part of uh, the actual, uh, which is actually not even part of the actual individual defense spending of each nation. So, but when you combine the actual uh, money that actually goes into NATO, it would actually uh, and combine it all together. You actually see uh, what's actually because there's a lot of uh, hidden money 
uh, because they don't want a lot of people to see what actually goes into this boondoggle. But what's uh, estimated is it's it would actually most likely rank as the third highest in uh, defense spending uh, globally. If it was an actual its own nation, it would be behind the United States and behind China. If not uh, at China's current rate, it might even be above China's current rate of spending, which is kind of insane. So it might actually rank second at this point because China has actually reduced its spending at its uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And in, in fact, they've, they've done a little bit of an upgrade on their last current year from uh, from their last current year. Uh, but but overall, with over the last three years, they've essentially done uh Three years ago, they had uh, about two hundred twenty-eight billion dollars. They reduced it down to about two hundred sixty-eight billion, and then uh, added about four billion to raise it up to about two hundred seventy-two billion. So they might even be above uh, the point of where China's at. So they might be at actually about seven. They might uh, actually have be if they were actually listed as a country, be in second place. Now this is an actual issue that shows that they're fighting nothing they're fighting a country that has basically potentially about a third of the defense spending and all they're doing is they're lining up defense bait uh, they're lining up basically tanks along the actual border and being the aggressors now when we go back to what the role of the United States should be is peace commerce and honest friendship with all nations uh, and then entangling alliances with none this means that we should not have any entangling alliances this would be basically no allies and it was and if you look at back at that time we didn't have any allies because we we felt that, that would essentially entangle us with uh, with getting into wars that were troublesome and he felt that this was very, very important. And he felt that because that would essentially jeopardize the idea of peace. And uh, when it looks at commerce with it, this means that he did not believe in sanctions. Sanctions were essentially an act of war. And if you look at what we're doing right now, we're tossed around sanctions like, like no one's business. Sanctions for Iran, sanctions for North Korea, sanctions for Russia, sanctions for Venezuela. Sanctions for anybody who deals with any of those countries. Now, if you look at that, that's basically we're tossing around sanctions like it doesn't even matter. And there's other countries that get sanctions as well. So there's sanctions basically flying around like, like nobody's business. Why are these sanctions flying around? Well, because, uh, because NATO says so, because uh, Israel says so, and because Saudi Arabia says so. And this is this is why we get back to the entangling alliances with none. That's why he specifically said this, because that that essentially hurt hurts commerce. And then honest friendship with all nations. Well, we don't have honest friendship with all nations. This is a big problem. This is the whole problem with what we're doing currently. Now, if we actually look at, uh, if we actually would go back to what we originally were meant uh, to do and uh, run our State Department and run, our dip uh, run diplomacy like this, we would actually see that we'd be doing things a lot differently. Uh, we're not even running the way we run immigration. We're not even running it fairly. They're basically, we treat na certain nations differently. We say, oh, but this nation has too many uh, fiancé visas. Well, maybe it's just because of the way the market works. Because we're supposed to have commerce with all nations. That's essentially, we need to be treating it like, a, like actually commerce. Open commerce should be the idea. And the fact is, maybe it's just because of the way things go. Maybe we should, uh, maybe the reason is with it is because we uh the females in our the females and males in our nation are just not as appealing to other nations as the females and uh and males in other nations for for the people in our nation and and certain nations are going to have more appeal than other nations 
because of certain uh, physical uh, appearances and certain uh, uh, social norms that they that they have there that they do not have here, and it's just based on how people are raised in certain areas of the country, or in certain areas of the world, I should say. And this is something that goes down to this idea of friendship with all nations. Now, when you start blocking this and you start doing the, doing it from that aspect, you're basically creating problems. And you should not be basically stating that, oh, this person's too uh, too young to come and come and visit the nation. Well, why? Oh, because because uh, because they're female, and a lot of people from their country marry other marry other males from uh, this country. Well, that's sexist. And pr the problem is, is in many nations we've been doing this, and we've been having a uh, sexist foreign policy. Uh, if you look at the with the Philippines, we've been having a sexist foreign policy with them for uh, for many uh, decades, and this has been this has been validated. And when you actually look at the numbers, does it actually validate having a policy? Does the policy actually make sense with us currently having public aid? And you would uh, when we start to actually validate the numbers, you'd actually say no. Because when they rank fourth highest in, uh, when Filipinos, when they come here as immigrants, rank fourth highest in earned income, you would actually have to say no. It does not make any legitimate sense because it shows they would not be uh, taking income. Their actual number in poverty is much lower than any other uh then races, East, East Asians themselves are much lower in poverty to begin with when they enter the country, when they're coming in the country. And most of these people in poverty are not in poverty for that long because they're making uh, do with their situation. Most often, those are only for a brief period of time when they're actually making, they're actually starting out at those situations because they refuse aid and they're working their way up. That's often what ends up happening. And they're not actually looking at the legitimacy of what's what's going on, and this means that basically is their actual numbers are based on pretty much uh, that they're trying to keep these people out. And what you need to do is this goes back to you need honest friendship with all nations. This refers to an immigration policy as well. And I think you need to go to basically is treating people, uh, uh, treating uh, countries and uh, equally, and understanding if you're going to have a immigration policy that's going to be based on uh, the risk of them taking public aid. If that's going to be one of your concerns, because that's why you actually have people sponsoring them based off of. Uh, based off of income, then you need to understand that it's going to be based, you need to base it off of uh, uh, what the risk of them uh, taking public aid is. And it needs to be legitimate, not not what necessarily what they have in their own country, but because that's not always going to be even amounts because uh, you're essentially, all you're going to be doing is targeting certain nations. That not necessarily are going to be in the same levels as the United States, because you could essentially be bringing in people that are less effective to the actual economy, and it could be uh, you could be bringing people that are going to be earning le uh, much less, even on uh, visitors' visas of people that might want to actually come and stay later on. Now, this is something that needs to be understood. And that that's that's part of this idea of uh, becoming a diplomat and uh, being a uh, running the State Department. That's a big portion of it. You need to inter you're interacting with other nations and exchange of people back and forth is a big part of it. You're going to have to understand that there needs to be some type of format of uh, a uh, reciprocation. And that is a uh, big thing that needs to be understood. And uh, 
this is something that when we look at the uh, when we look at some of these ideas of uh, how we look into immigration we need to uh, understand that it needs to be reciprocated so if we're not going to uh, reciprocate with other nations when we're talking about immigration I mean the Philippines could easily tell uh, could easily tell women that are not married under the age of 50 that they're not allowed to uh, visit the Philippines and we could start screaming that is uh, that is racist but uh, that that, that or, sorry that is a big bigoted against uh, and sexist against women but the fact is is that is that is merely the activity of being of reciprocating the thing for uh, their citizens and this is what happens when you get when you can do this this is what and it's nothing more than uh, a uh, reciprocating a uh, retaliation for what they've had uh, for uh, decades of what's been done to them and they could easily be doing this to uh, our citizens and uh, when there's many people that like to go out to the Philippines for uh, for their beaches and such I mean you will find many many female that are in their 20s uh, like to go out to the Philippines to go visit their beaches and such you'll find a lot of videos on YouTube for it and then you'll eventually you'll see that uh, you could eventually see that where they end up shutting it down because of that. Well, that's because we're not having an honest friendship with them. We're not allowing a reciprocation on vis uh, on visiting. If you want basically, uh, if you want your citizens to be able to visit uh, the Philippines, you need to make sure that the Philippine citizens are allowed to visit your country. Don't make up some silly rule that basically says, oh, no, 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 we're not going to allow them because we think they're going to marry our citizens. Well, if they're going to marry your citizens with it, uh, you need to understand how marriage works. Marriage is actually a basic a contract in which both parties agree. It doesn't matter. There's no, trust me, there's no people that have, that have magic that can make people uh, say yes. There's no, that doesn't exist. Otherwise, you're, otherwise you're, uh, you're agreeing that basically that uh, you're going with the idea that you are agreeing that uh, Filipinas offer much more to the American male than, uh, than the American females could ever offer. And that's what's causing the American males to actually jump after these uh, uh, f uh, these uh, Philip uh, these Philippines uh, females, and these uh, where these Filipinas are actually marrying uh, are actually uh, marrying them. Now that's the only that, that would be the only legitimate argument against it. That means you're saying that our actual supply of females is so weak. That, that this is what is causing this because that's your own that would be your only legitimate statement that would actually cause that and you're saying oh there's some type of infiltration now if you look at their values you would actually see that uh, their values are not exactly bad when you see their values they're very uh, they're very very family oriented they're actually uh, they're uh, government that is actually based on our government it's actually based on the Constitution and they're actually more apt to be politically involved and uh, they tend to follow a lot closer to what the found what our founders actually insist on so and they tend to uh, believe the idea of basically being a lot more uh, politically insistent on uh, a more constitutional government when it comes down to uh, things and they will tend to get very very involved when it doesn't happen that way which is also possibly another reason why this hasn't been reciprocated now when we talk about uh, what we need to do globally from that actual from our actual State Department is beyond just the, between the US and Philippines is we need to understand that we should not be controlled by any one nation or any one uh, 
non-governmental organization itself. And this is where the Entangling Alliances comes in. And this is where uh, 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 Thomas Jefferson knew what he was talking about. And we're basically allowing that. Basically, we have uh, Benjamin Netanyahu talking these insane conspiracy theories that should basically make him locked up in a mental institution. We have people like uh, Ben Shapiro repeating the same crazy things. We have peop we have neoconservatives, uh, more neoconservatives, uh, like Bill Crystal, like uh, uh, like John Bolton, uh, like. Uh, Secretary of State Mike, Mon Mike Pompeo repeating these insane conspiracy theories about Iran when they don't even exist and basically wanting to uh, to essentially go against the ideas of Jefferson when they're completely insane. And uh, these were the same ones that came up with the conspiracy theory that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and wanted to basically continue that lie to this day and state that, oh no, it wasn't a lie, it was a, it was a misinterpreted intelligence. And that this is what they do to this day. And they don't want to admit that it was a lie. And they want to say, oh, it's the, le it's the left that wants, that wants to say it's a lie. It's not just the left, it's, pe it's everybody that says it's a lie because it is a, it was a lie from the beginning because you had Benjamin Netanyahu that was out there per perpetuating the lie you had John Bolton who was perpetuating the lie you had uh, Ari Fleischer who was perpetuating the lie you had uh, uh, Dick Cheney who was perpetuating the lie you had the President uh, Bush who was perpetuating the lie you had Colin Powell who was perpetuating the lie it was going everywhere. There were, these were the people that were, uh, you had uh, John McCain was perpetuating the lie. These were all the people that they knew it was fake. They knew it was as fake as can be. And they knew it was a big bunch of hogwash. And they, they knew it, it was uh, basically that all the intelligence said that basically, uh, all the legitimate intelligence said that there was nothing there, and there was there were no weapons of mass destruction, and that obviously he he posed zero, he posed no threat to the United States, and there was no link to 9/11 whatsoever, but he they wanted to make this lie up. Now, if you look at uh, now, if they would have actually followed what. Uh, Jefferson was doing with it, they would realize that we would look past any type of thing that he was doing with his people, and we would have actually looked to peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, and we would never have intervened. We would go on, we would have basically relied on their own people. Now we have a situation where we basically look like fools, and, uh, the ones who actually look like the ones who actually want peace in the region is Iran. Iran wants is the only one, Iran's the one uh, perpetuating peace in the region. You have Saudi Arabia and Israel who want to perpetuate war, as usual. The, these were the ones that uh, have been perpetuating war. Uh, Israel's the one that actually perpetuated the lies of uh, of Iraq basically having weapons of mass destruction and Saudi Arabia is the one that basically was uh, responsible for 9-11 and that's what that's what we have now if you look at it is this is why we should not be, even be allied with these and this is why it says entangling alliances with none where you have entangling alliances with the one government who has uh, links who's linked with the people who are who are basically the ones who funded the ones who attacked us, and you have the other ones who are basically the ones who basically told, uh, who are basically one of the many groups who told us this lie about the uh, about Iraq, which basically destroyed the Middle East, and they continue these lies, 
and they do this because they want to restructure the Middle East, and they're and the, those people are actually allied with the ones who attacked us on 9/11. So we can either a be allied with the people who are actually uh, attacked us on 9/11, plus the people who actually themselves are allied with the people who, are, who attacked us on 9/11. Or, in the other hand, we can actually uh, look to uh, have no entangling alliances and actually look for peace, uh, commerce, honest friendship with all nations, and have no entangling alliances. As Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, and the one who actually should be setting the actual ground rules for how you should be running it. This is basically how we actually should be doing this. I mean, this is the actual standard. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. I mean, how stupid do we have to uh, do? These people have to be. You look what Hillary Clinton did as Secretary of State. You look what Colin Powell did as Secretary of State. You look what John. You look what Mike Pompeo is trying to do as Secretary of State. You look what. Uh, you look what all of them have done as Secretary of State, and then you look with uh, what our actual uh, history of of uh, Thomas Jefferson was. I think you can actually say that these other morons are going to be uh, remembered as people who were starting wars. When you go with like John Kerry, you go with Hillary Clinton, you go with Mike Pompeo, you go with other ones like uh, uh, Colin Powell. Those are, are the bottom of the barrel. These are people who are basically should be in jail. And then you go with Thomas Jefferson, who actually had, who actually is one of the one of the greats in history. I think there's a little bit of a difference between the two. I think when we when we think about Thomas Jefferson, I think we can think of uh, people who are kind of like the greats in history. And if we actually follow what he was talking about, we would act, we wouldn't be in this actual issue. And that's basically the whole point. Now, if you like this uh, podcast, like, subscribe, click the notification bell, make sure you share it all the way around with friends and everyone else uh, publicly. Make sure you check out my Patreon page. If you can't donate, make sure to share with someone who can. And I will see what we do for our nightly podcast, nightly live stream. And that's about it, everyone. See you later.